This is my material, the six shifts webinar, and today I'm talking about one shift, which is shifting you. Right? The six shifts are about taking your business from manual to scalable. And I'm going to unmute you, mate, and if someone else comes, I'll mute you up again. All right, so you're unmuted, so if you feel like having a chat or interrupting me, Adam, you can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. That's yeah. Right. Not a problem. Cool. You sound like you're in a car or something. No, no, I'm in the office. Hey, it's going noisy, that's all. Yeah. Probably the bloody air conditioner, but I can't turn it off, I'll die. Yeah, no, don't do that. I've just turned mine on too. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so let me, I'll get started. I've got a script. I'm going to smash through it. If you need to ask me anything, just interrupt. If other people join, I'll mute you again. Otherwise, it becomes a bit chaotic. So you run a yeah. business, and this should ring true, right? I'll try and, um, you know, relate it to things you said to me earlier. Yeah. You run your business, you're proud of it probably. I know you work long hours because you told me. And I know it's precarious and work could dry up any day, and of course it just has a bit. You're only as good as your last project. Staff are difficult. Customers are usually difficult. And it often, it doesn't flow, right? It feels a bit scratchy or a bit manual. And that's the theme I'm going with, right? Lots of businesses, including yours, are a bit manual. If you're not there, pushing away, things crash, or slow down, or don't work as they should. It's a common theme, right? I'm going to show you about these six strategic shifts that you make to the manual one you've got, that you make, to take it from the manual one you've got now, where you've got to work long hours and where it's very dependent on you and precarious, to one where there's a nice flow of work coming in, and a flow of work getting done, and where things happen as they should more, and where people do what they should. So I'm John, my business is called Small Fish Business Coaching because it's for small fishers like you and like me. It's not for large companies. And I left corporate because I wanted to work with real people. You know, working with corporate, you're working with suits, you don't really give a shit. And you're just a cog in a big wheel and it's a bit meaningless. So I wanted to work with actual people, people I could like or not like or choose to work with or not. And I built the tradies toolbox because I found myself working with lots of tradies you suffer from the same frustrations a lot. And I figured out a couple of things. I got myself a business coach, a chap called Taki Moore, who's a business coach for business coaches. And I figured out that if I make a program for tradies, I can do a couple of things. I can get right into the nitty gritty of a trades business instead of trying to talk about all businesses. So I can build a better coaching program than the way I used to do my coaching because I can anticipate what your issues are by focusing on things I know are common to trades. And I can help more people at once because I can leverage the teaching bits and teach it to all of you at once. And I can niche my marketing better and make my marketing more effective so I can make more money as well, which is important too. I'd like to make more money too. So this webinar talks briefly about the six strategic shifts you need to make and then talks in some detail about the one, the you one. Uh, and I like, to, I like to think of a business as there's three pieces, and we've got a pie somewhere. That's me with a beer, by the way, in the Beach Hotel in Byron. All right, three pieces to a business, three pieces of the pie. You need to get work in, obviously. You need to do it and get it done. And you need to get the people working well. If you don't get your people working well, that's you and your guys, you're in a lot of trouble. So we've got, I've expanded this little theme a little bit with another slide. If you get, talk about get work in, we can consider that as marketing to find it and then sales to win it. Right, and these are the six shifts now that I'm talking about. Right. So the first one is marketing to find the business. The second one is sales to win it. The third one is operations to do the work. And the fourth one is the back office or the admin to get paid for it, to make sure you pay your bills, to make sure you pay taxes, to make sure you meet your compliance obligations. And so it all kind of works. And then you've got your people, and we've got you and your team. And the six shifts go something like this. Shift your marketing from manual to automated. Shift your sales from focusing on price to focusing on value and focusing on your customers so you can charge more, so you can do it without it taking all your time, thrashing through all those quotes like we talked about. Shifting those operations from being a bit informal so that you need to kind of keep an eye on everything, to being systematized and structured and process driven 
so it's easier for people to work without your direct supervision, without you needing to be in charge. If that back office, so everything runs like a smoothly operating machine. Shift you from working in the business and on the tools and being overworked and underperforming to being in control and effective and then shifting your team from a pain in the ass and a liability to being an asset and a support to you. Okay, so the webinar and of course business coaching is about three things, right? And I really think it's about time and money and control. Everything we talk about, each of those shifts, is about helping you make more money or get time back for yourself and your family or control back so you're less stressed. Right, so you've got control back from either the business or your customers or your shit, or the shit fight that it is. Quick rules for the day. I won't spend long here because only you and me, Adam. I'm going to go quite fast. I swear a bit. I'm sorry. Uh, if you want to interrupt, you can. You're not muted, so you can just shout. If I do start muting you, um, then you'll have to type a question in. And of no course, worries. it's marketing. For, yeah, really. It's marketing for my coaching, right? So this is some of the an, an overview of some of the content for the coaching program. You know, so if you do the coaching, this is some of the stuff we'll cover. And some of the stuff I'll try and help you change. All right, what emotion have you brought to, with you today, Adam? Hope you get the most from this hour. Um, I just need change. I think. Something's yeah, going to okay. change. The last two years, the work, but now I'm in debt. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I'm, you know, I'll, I'll be more in debt and bankrupt, I think. Yeah, you don't want that, do you? No. It's easily done. Yeah. All right, look, I'll give you my story. I used to work in corporate. I used to work for Optus, in fact. I know I was a strategic account manager for Optus, managing major accounts like IBM and AMP. I didn't like it. I got sick of it. Started small fish in 2006. Got successful quite quickly. Was a good coach, you know. Built it up quite well, and I went looking for leverage, right, for a way to build my business beyond my ability to coach people, right? which is what you're doing, right? Leverage for you is having people do the work while you go and find the jobs. And I was yeah. trying to do the same thing, the business coach. So I went down the franchising route. I recruited and trained business coaches to do what I was doing. I thought, this is great. I thought it was going to conquer the world, actually. Yeah, I've got 25 of them. I had seven staff. I had a call center making appointments. I was on page one of Google for business coach. And then along came the GFC, and it all went to shit. Small businesses stopped spending the money. Business coaches couldn't get mortgage extensions to buy franchisees. And all my 25 disappeared and went back to getting jobs, or well, most of them. They came to an abrupt end. We ran out of money. I lost all my money, personally. Um, it was a bit shit, right? I had a, I had a horrible time. I went back to being a coach myself instead of, you know, CEO of a global business. Started again in 2012, this was. Started again, built my business back up slowly. About a year ago, started looking for leverage again. Decided I didn't want to try franchising again. I was a bit stuck. I was banking okay money. I was a bit limited by being in Byron Bay, which is a small town. I like living here. I couldn't grow much more. I was doing my marketing manually. I was doing lots of networking. I was having individual meetings with people. I was doing individual coaching. I got this business coach, Taki, and I started on the same journey, the one I'm talking to you about. Really, I started making those shifts, big strategic shifts. And I'm probably, it's a bit more than a year now, I'm probably a year and a half down the track of that journey. Now, I've built myself a marketing machine. Right, I've got Venus here helping me. I'm doing these webinars. I've got all that email marketing that you've seen. Right, and I'm explaining my stuff. Sometimes, usually, on a webinar like this, there are three or four or five or ten people, not just one. So I'm usually talking to a few people at once. I send my emails to eight or nine hundred traders every week. I run workshops, and there's one in Byron in about three weeks, Adam, or four. You're welcome to come to. Right, so I'm building my machines. Right, I've got Venus in the Philippines, and I've got Lindsay in Miami helping me do my marketing and the administration of my business. So I can focus on what I'm good at, which is the coaching and the selling, and the learning new stuff to teach my clients, instead of the boring bits that I'm not very good at anyway. I'm shifting my sales to a more automated process. I've built a back office machine that works really well with these guys. Right, so my point really is I'm on the same journey. Right? I'm making the six shifts, and I'm seeing the benefits. I'm making more money than I used to. I'm making more money than I was making before the GFC, 
when I thought, hey, I'm so good at this, I can teach other people how to do it. And I've got a bigger sales pipeline than I've ever had, and I can feel this momentum. So it's quite exciting. So I'm taking my own medicine, getting the results I'm going to promise you. And I'm well on my way to building a, a, a leveraged coaching delivery mechanism that will mean I can coach more than the 15 or 20 I can coach now, you know, maybe 50 or 100. And make a proper business like the one I know you want to. All right, so a quick question, right? And remember, this is normally for an audience. What's been the most useful so far? Um, oh, well, I guess um, I guess knowing what business coaching is about um, from our earlier phone call as well. I've never spoken to a business coach or know much about them, so um, yeah, good. probably pretty good. Good. All right. All right. I'll move on. Quick recap. Then the six shifts. Marketing to find work, sales to win it, operations to do it, the back office to get paid for it, make you more effective and make your team more effective. And today I'm talking about you. So you're just going to have to um, imagine the others for now. I'm going to run, run these every month. You know, of course you're welcome to come and listen to them every month. We've got them recorded somewhere if you want to get those. And of course this is what I talk about in that workshop in May as well. Now I'll spend two days on a weekend in May, end of May, going through those six strategic shifts. All right, so shifting you from working in it and being busy to working on it and being in control. This is about getting you out of the guts of it, off the tools if you're on them, or out of the guts of managing day-to-day -day stuff like your boys and your jobs and your sites, so you can be strategic. And it's about where you spend your time, and it's about choices you make, about where you spend your time and your resources and your efforts. About being strategic instead of tactical, it's about time management and prioritization. It's about mindset and getting over yourself. And it's about embracing the new way instead of the old way. And it can be quite hard, right? That changing bit is quite hard, but it's also the best bit. So that's when you get your real change. So at the moment, you're a bottleneck. Because you're so involved in everything, your business can only be as big as, as kind of what you can cope with personally. And at the moment, you're really busy, right? You're running around like a blue-ass fly. You've got no time to rest. You know, you're either running jobs or trying to get through quotes or trying to follow up on quotes or, you know, make things happen all the time. You've got no time to enjoy yourself, enjoy your business. You probably work too many hours. You miss the kids or you miss out on your wife. You've got a baby, haven't you? Yeah, twins. Twins, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, I bet you are around like a blue ass fly, aren't you? Yeah, I do. I run off about six hours maximum sleep a day. Yeah, I bet you do. Mm. Bloody hell, twins. Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> I said bloody hell, twins. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's lovely as well. I like kids. It, it's good moments. They got their, they got their good days and their bad days. They're being good at the moment. Which is good. They're only yeah, 11 months. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, let me move on then. I'll forget otherwise. You've got a wheelbarrow business is my next slide. Right, if you stop working and you put it down, it stops. It doesn't carry on without you. And you'll never be able to stop. Right, and this is true of, of my business too. Right, and I don't think a wheelbarrow business is the end of the world, but it's certainly we'd like a business that lets us go on holiday and works without us. So if you make some of these changes, right, if you extract yourself from it so it can work without you, nice things happen. You can scale, right? You're not a bottleneck anymore, so your business can get bigger, like the Grand Canyon there. You can work less hard if you do the, make these shifts and make these shifts I'm going to talk to you about today with you, which is always nice, nice to work fewer hours or less hard. You can have other people doing more stuff for you, right? If you build the machines properly, you support people to do their jobs, you get that lovely leverage. But if you do it, if you do all these things, you can enjoy your business more, right? If you extract yourself and let go of that need to do everything yourself, you can enjoy your business more. You can sit on your yacht or have holidays or enjoy the ride a bit more and make life better. And one more quick point. This stuff is possible. You know, I get a lot of tradies particularly say, how is this possible, John? I'll never be able to do that. You know, if I don't do it, it just fucks up. 
and it is possible, you know, look at people like Tease. Right? Anybody who's bigger than about 5 million has done this stuff, has built these systems and made these machines, and one person can't look after the detail of everything. If you look at any big business, and I pick construction, obviously, um, you know, that's what they've done, and you can do it too. All right, so what should you be doing? Some principles. And I th I'm thinking now of you and how you behave in your business, right? So don't think about marketing or sales or the operations because that's another topic. This is about you and how you behave in your day. And remember, I've got you, in my mind, involved in lots of it, doing lots of quotes, supervising all the jobs or even on the tools for every job or some of the jobs and kind of in the detail of things, working really hard, maybe not being as effective as you should. And all those things, right? So here's one principle that goes on here. It's called interruptions. I know this is something that affects most of us all the time. We live in an interruption culture. I'm sure this is true for you. I just heard your phone go off before. No, you didn't answer it. Probably should make sure mine's off. But they ring all the time, right? We kind of have this expectation that we can be reached. Everything's set up so we can be interrupted, you know? We've got emails. And they can ping through on your screen when you're doing something. Or they can ring, ding on your phone, or a Facebook message can ding, or a text, or a WhatsApp message. And they can come on your computer and on your phone, right? It's really hard to escape from that kind of, that, that interruption, that interruption culture is what I'm calling it. And, and in truth, what that really is, is somebody else wanting you to do what they want, rather than you getting to do what you want to do. So I'm going to say, let's try and resist that interruption culture. And I'll teach you tricks and small things to help you do that. Because right? I know you can't just switch your phone off and disappear and lose business. But you don't need to be as available as I think we think we need to be. You know? And this affects me quite a lot. You know, I can be in the middle of something like writing this, this presentation and the phone rings and I'll answer it. No, and really, I've lost 20 minutes when I've been interrupted. The science, the psychology says, when you get interrupted from a task like that, it's 15 or 20 minutes, I think it's 17, before you're kind of back in the flow properly. So the trick is to try and avoid some interruptions, you know. Don't use, turn your voicemail off. Sorry. Turn your email off when you're trying to do something. Don't let yourself flick back into it. Turn all those um, notifications off. So it doesn't pop up on your screen and say, oh, you just had an email. Because it makes you go, oh, I wonder what it said. You know, if you've got a job to do, a quote, for example, turn everything off while you get it done. You know, if, if you feel like you need to be available to people when they call, you know, you need to change that, right? And you need to turn your phone off sometimes and give yourself that hour or that two hours to do the difficult jobs. And I've had some people set, change their voicemail to say something like, hey, it's called Dallas actually, hey, it's Dallas. I answer my phone at 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock and 4 o'clock. Leave me a message and I'll call you back at one of those times. And people don't mind. And then he's got time during the day to do his work. So I encourage you to do that. No, I encourage you to not use email to communicate. I don't know if this will probably make sense to you, but mostly what people do with email is they just fire something off a response or a question, and they know it's not their responsibility anymore, right? They've sent responsibility off to someone else too. It becomes this really kind of bad situation where nothing really gets done. Everyone just goes, bang, not my problem anymore. Get it off your list. So stuff doesn't get solved or fixed, you know? So that I think the best thing to do is to pick up the phone, talk to people, get things agreed, and then follow it up in writing to confirm what you've agreed, rather than allow this toing and froing with email. But it's so easy and so tempting. All right. So another principle. Have you heard the story of the rocks in the jar? There's some rocks in a jar. Thanks, Venus. So there's a story, Adam, of rocks in the jar, right? And the idea is, if you fill that jar up with pebbles and sand and water, the rocks won't go in. 
but we have in our business the need to get the rocks in, right? We need to do the big, difficult jobs. You know, we need to build the marketing plan. We need to change the way we write your proposals. We need to go and spend a couple of hours with an important builder. We need to get quality certified. We need to hire a new person, right? All those difficult things. But they'll easily get pushed aside by all the little shitty jobs we've got to do every day. And the little ones displace the big ones. And you can get to the end of the week and realize you didn't place the ad or write the job description or go and see the big builder or, didn't, or call the big, the big guy to make an appointment. And all those things can get deferred and displaced by the shitty things, all those fires you fight. So what we do in coaching, of course, is make decisions about what those rocks are, what those important things are that need doing, and then find ways to get those things done before the shit fight happens and pushes them all to one side. The ways to do it, start your day with one of those rocks, with one of those important jobs before you switch your email and your phone on. Get something knocked out of the way. Segment a bit of time away from everything else, you know, so you can get a big job done. And this is what I do, I just sat in a cafe for an hour writing a new letter to market the workshop that's coming up in a new way that we've learned. Because I knew if I sat in my office with the emails on, I would get distracted by them. So I actually sent, send myself away without a computer. So I sit in a cafe with a pen and a pad and write it, and then I photograph it and send it to Venus to type up. Sorry, Venus. <laughs> this is this making sense, Adam? Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. <clears throat> I like that rocks in the jar. I just uh, wrote it down. <laughs> yeah, look, it's Stephen Covey, if you want to go and read it. He wrote um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, among other things, and I'm pretty sure it's his story. If you want to Google it, you'll find it. You'll find a little story, you know. Okay. So it's yeah. quite fun. He talks about it in a life context. You know, the rock star, your relationships with your family and things like that. But it's important in a business sense, too. Okay, look, another principle, another thing. Overwhelm. Right, it's easy to get overwhelming, overwhelmed rather. Sorry. Thanks, Venus. Yeah, isn't it? Like, there's so much to do, you know? There's so much to do, all of it's so important, and you've got all the shit fight of the normal business life to get to deal with as well, and it's stressful because if you don't win work, you're fucked, and it can get overwhelming, and what can happen is you get a bit paralyzed and you don't do any of the important things. And because we're a bit paralyzed and a bit stressed out, we just do the shitty easy ones, which is really, and then you know we don't really make any progress. So it's quite important to help us deal with this overwhelm. You know, and I'm I'm armed with lots of tricks and strategies to help you do that, right? You know, if we go and write down a big list of all your rocks, and I did this yesterday, right? I did this yesterday with my big tasks and medium tasks, and I got one, two, three, four, five, six, eight rocks, and uh, fifteen medium sized tasks, and about thirty. You know, small jobs that I can get done out of the way in 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so. So too, far too much for me to do in a day or even a week. Right? But I've written my big list. And what I do is I pick a couple of them to get to. So I actually picked four of the little jobs and one of the big ones to get to. And I put them in my diary. I actually scheduled an hour in my diary to write that sales letter. And I finished it. I managed to get it done. Took two, it took longer than I thought it was going to be, and longer than I scheduled in my diary, but I managed to schedule it again this morning and put another hour in today and get it finished. So that's a way of dealing with it, you know, of going, right, fuck everything else, I'm just going to do that one. And deciding that before the chaos comes in and takes over. So you can do like a 15-minute session every morning to kind of plan your day. Right, where's my list that I made on Monday? What am I going to squeeze in today in, the, in my meetings, in between my meetings, and my jobs and my being on site? You know, the stuff you've got to do and you need time to do it. Which ones can you manage today? Make that decision and then forget about all the stress and all the other demands on you. And you're a bit less cluttered in your head. Part of the reason I know some of this stuff is my girlfriend's a psychologist. And so she helps me, do, you know, she researches some of the neuroscience around what's going on here. And she says, you get a dopamine rush, which is very nice, when you finish something. So when you finish a little job, 
you get this little dopamine rush of well done, I've succeeded something. And it's quite rewarding quite quickly. Whereas getting stuck into the big job like the sales letter, the reward's ages away. Right? You're probably not going to finish it today or even tomorrow. So you know, there's no dopamine rush coming. You don't get rewarded. So it's really hard to do those jobs. And it's really easy to get distracted by, oh, I'll just phone Phil, make sure that's cleared up. I'll just deal with that and I'll just place that order or so what happens is the big jobs always get deferred. And so another thing you can do is make a little system of rewards. And this is something I'm practicing. When I've done an hour on the big job, I'll give myself a little reward. You know, a cup of coffee, walk around the block, play on Facebook, you know, something nice that's enjoyable. Instead of because I'm not getting that dopamine rush, right? And then what happens is I go away for ten or fifteen minutes, do something else. I come back, I'm a bit refreshed, and I'll perform better anyway. So as you can see, there's quite a lot going on here, right? In terms of making us perform better, there's quite a lot going on in quite a lot going on in terms of dealing with all the millions of things we need to do and figuring out which ones we can actually get done. So I'll help you figure out which ones are priorities in coaching, and I'll help you apply some of these strategies so that you do get some of them done. Because if you're not careful, you always just sort of die straight back into being overwhelmed and then just dealing with the fires. All right, here's another principle. Focus. It's really important to get a little bit clear on what you should be doing and what you should not be doing. Because of all this pressure from everywhere else, from your customers and your staff and your suppliers and the jobs and the other trades, you know, there's a lot of people who want you to do what, need, what they need you to do. And it, like I said, it's really easy to just kind of go with that and never go where you want to go. And a good part of, of going where you want to go is focus, being focused on where that is. The first thing we do, of course, is make a strategy and write it down. But it's also important to stick to it, or at least come back to it when you've been dragged off by an emergency or a fire that needed putting out and keep going in that direction. So that's why it's important to have coach, sorry, to have focus. You need to be clear on what you're doing and what you shouldn't be doing. You need to make decisions and you need to try and stick to them. If I'm a coach, of course, I help. I'm going to meet every fortnight and I'm going to look at our coaching notes and say, did you do that? And if you got sidetracked by other people, we'll at least know that and we can make decisions about how to help you get it done during the next week. This is other people's priorities, is what I've been talking about, right? Other people always want you to do stuff for them or to help drive their agenda. And it's not necessarily what you need to be doing to get to where you want to go, to get to where you've decided is your, your goal, your vision. Don't fucking tell me what to do. Nice slide, Venus. <laughs> no, and it's really important. I know. Me and I'm going to give you five stars for that. I like that a lot. Right. It's really important. Everyone's always telling us what to do. If you think about it, most of our stuff in our business life is other people trying to get us to do something for them. Every email is some bastard trying to either wriggle out of doing something or get you to do something. Every phone call, every time someone talks to you on a site, it's all somebody else trying to get you to do something. Sometimes it contributes to what you want to do but sometimes and quite often not. You need to be able to resist that a bit. And what I've written in my notes is you should consider not always doing what someone asks you to do. Right? And actually the, the, our instinct, if someone says, can you do this, or you need to do this, or you should do this, our instinct is to try and do it. So it's quite important to try and resist and go, hang on, should I do this? Right, another, another principle, another point. This shit's difficult. Making these changes is really difficult. You've got this far by doing what you're doing now. Right? And I'm going to start trying to tell you to do things very differently. I'm going to start trying to get you to change. You're going to find that difficult and you're going to resist it. And in fact, my girlfriend, the psychologist, Michelle, is writing me a program that I'm going to give to my clients on, on managing change, on how to manage change and how to manage how difficult that change is. But now, just understand, you know, it's going to be hard. 
to change the way you do it from what you do now to the new way is going to be challenging mentally. It's going to be scary. Everyone else is going to tell you what awful consequences you're going to face if you don't do what they want. You know, you start letting your guys have more autonomy, they're going to fuck up. All those kinds of things you're going to be scared of, right? You're going to be scared of letting go. You're going to be scared of not having control. So my point really is, understand that's, that's going to be a bit scary. Understand it's okay for it to be a bit scary. Understand it's okay not to get it right straight away, and it's okay to kind of take baby steps. Because every step counts. It's, all, it's okay to take small steps, get a small win, and then have another go, and take another step. And that's how everyone does it, right? That's how we make change. We don't make change by going instantly from here to the beautiful vision. It takes time. And I heard somebody say recently, one of the most defining characteristics of entrepreneurs is actually patience. Prepared to take the time for it to ch for it to happen, which I found was I thought was quite interesting because they normally say it's determination or never giving up. All right, another principle. And I'm coming to the end now. Right. Something interesting that we do, something interesting that I do in coaching a lot, is to come at things from the other direction. There he is. Look, he's coming at himself from the mirror. Right? If you're working too hard and you're not getting the rocks done, what's intuitive for people to do is to try and make space so that you've got time to do those jobs. And I think you said this morning, or we discussed it anyway, you know, how, how are you going to have time to do the stuff I'm going to tell you to do or suggest you do? And it's true, right? And I think the answer is, if you're not careful, there'll never be time, right? Work, fill, work expands to fill the space you give it, right? There's always work to do. You've never done it, have you? Ever, ever, ever. Right? And, and kind of this idea that I'll make space in my day or my week or my month or my business to do all this new stuff, I think is a bit misleading. And so what I want to suggest is you come at it from the other direction and do it anyway. Right? If you want to work less and spend more time with the kids, which I imagine you do, I'm pretty sure your wife wants you to, one way to do it is just to do it. Just turn everything off and fuck off home at 6 o'clock and be done with it. You know, to book that gym session in at one o'clock and go. You know, if you want to cheat, book an appointment in with a personal trainer who you've got to pay if you turn up or not, because you'll go then. <laughs> book holidays and flights, you know. And commit yourself to going. I know so many people who say, I did want to have a holiday this year, but I didn't get a chance. Well, if you book one, you'll go, you know. You'd be surprised what happens if you come at it from the other direction. Now what happens is if you book the holiday and the flights, you know, two weeks before your missus starts going, ooh, we're going in two weeks. We'll make arrangements for the business to cope without you for a week. What else have I written? Don't go into the office until the quote is finished. Right, so stay at home. Finish that quote that you need to do today instead of going in and trying to get everything sorted and, and then getting to six o'clock and going, oh, I never did the quote. Right, and I know this is scary, and I know it's not really the answer on its own, but... but Approaching it like this has quite a lot of value. Okay. So I'm coming to the end of what I want to teach you today, right? There's a, that's a quick selection. There's a bucket load more. We'll think about reducing the jobs you do, delegating things to other people, getting new support like a PA or a virtual assistant like Venus here, managing your week more strongly, looking at where your time does go and looking at what happens there to try and make decisions about what to do. Helping you let go and be less of a control freak. You know, encouraging you to get off the tools. And of course, building these six machines, right? Building a marketing machine and a sales machine. Writing down and documenting the systems and the checklists so you guys can do stuff without you needing to supervise. All that helps you have to do less, too. So the systems and the, and the six shifts are important as well. So if you did this, if you did this, Adam, if you got yourself out of the guts of it a bit more, you made yourself as effective as possible, and you built these machines, and you built this leverage business. How good would that be? What would be the effect? That would be great. I think it will, yeah, it will give me time to, well, I guess I was going to say give me time to market and find more work, but if I've got a machine that's 
marketing for me anyway. I won't have to do that. Yeah, um, but you might be part of the machine. I'm still part of my marketing machine. Look, I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. You know, but it's it's easier than trying to do everything myself. And I've made decisions. Some of it's automated using technology. Some of it is Venus doing it for me. And some of it is is it easier in a machine because I made decisions about what I had to do months ago, and now I just have to do them rather than waking up today and going, "What am I going to do today?" To get this? Yeah. But there's, you know, it, it can be part of the machine. Yeah. But look, it is beautiful, isn't it? It's all no, time, it money, and control. All right, look, there's a sales pitch coming now, Adam, and you've already bought the strategy session, so I don't need to go through it too much. The sales pitch, actually, let me show you the six shift slider, though. Can we do it in the slider, Venus? I'll show you this, you'll like this. So I've told you what, what the coaching is this morning. Right, so it's a workshop where we put a strategy together. And don't be surprised if it if we try and walk, describe what what you want to get, what you want to achieve. And then if there are those six things: marketing and sales and operations, back office and the people team. Venus, can you get us to? No, not that one. Is the one with the sliders? I think it might be after this one. Okay, we need a slider slide. This will do. I want a slider slide now. Let's make one. So, what I've got here, Adam, is I've got this picture in my head of a slider, you know, with like a wooden bead on a abacus or something. And I said, look, marketing, if over here on the left is manual and over there on the right is fully automated, where are you? you now, are you at zero, fully manual? You're pretty much near zero, right? You haven't yeah. got much going on with marketing. And wouldn't it, you know? And and we'll think about how we move it towards more automated. What I'd like to do, maybe you could write yourself one down in your notebook, and write marketing and put zero to ten, manual and automated, and put a cross where you are. And in a year, we'll do it again. Yeah. So, yeah. Looking with sales, you know, shifting you from from being a quoting monkey. To having this lovely value focus, so you quote fewer jobs, because you qualify out of the shit ones, and you go and put more effort than quoting into the ones where you can win. Mm -hmm. We shift your delivery from being you dependent to being this lovely machine, and your back office from being a bit ad hoc and informal to being this lovely machine. We shift you, which is what we talked about today, from being in it and frazzled to on it and effective, your team from a headache to an asset. I will go back to that ladder, Venus. I'll show you this as well. Because there are stages in business, and we talked a little bit about... Um, no, we didn't, did we? We didn't talk about the... Oh, I've forgotten the name of the book. What's the book called? The E-Myth. Have you heard of the E-Myth? No, never. Okay, it's a book. All business coaches read it. Not many traders do, but most business coaches do. And it's by a guy who has a business coaching franchise in the States called Michael Gerber. And it's really appealing, you know. He talks about businesses having three stages. One is infancy, where you start by being good at the work of the business. So you go and you get work at that, and it's great, and happy days, and you make money, and then you get busier, and you can't really do it all on your own, so you start recruiting people. And that's kind of where you are, right? You're at the top of that. You're in infancy. You're still very much in it. And in order for you to grow much further, you've got to build these machines and not be the person doing the work of your business, but be the person directing things, right? And this is what this anti-stress ladder is about. And when you start, you're new, you've got no money, you've got spare time because there's no work to do yet. As you grow a bit, you, I'm calling you a sole tradie, right? You're working part-time now and you've got a bit more money, but you've still got a job. And you move into having a business and you become an employer. You're working full time, you've got some money, right? And that's like monthly income of 20k, that kind of number. You're an employer. As you get a bit bigger, you're more of a fixer. You're working overtime because you're working hard now. And you're up to maybe 50k a month or more, 100. You've got people working for you, so you've got a business. And then beyond that, 
you built a beautiful machine, right? And you're driving it. You've got you're in money time, so you've got plenty of time now. You don't need to work so hard because you've got money to pay other people to do things for you. And then as you get bigger still, you're the general, you know, pushing your tanks around the underground bunker while everyone else gets shot. And you're in free time, and you're and you're the general in charge of this machine. So where where my program works is for people who want to go from being a kind of an employer and move up that ladder. Right? If you're a newbie and you're and you've, you're just looking for work for you, you know you shouldn't spend the fifty pound if you're too small. But if you want to build that thing, that's what I'm going to help you do. I'm going to help you build those machines. So that went really quickly today, Adam. Yeah, you've already booked the strategy session next week, so we've, you know I don't need to try and get you to do anything because you've done it already. Yep. All right. Any questions? Great. Um, I don't think so. I think we've covered a lot this morning, and that made everything pretty clear as well. Um, that was good. I think on that uh, ladder we're looking at there, I think I was up at the fixer stage, and I was about to cross that orange line and be a driver, and, and I fell down to a, probably a sole trader, and that's where I met a I think you did too, yeah. 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 I think well, you're right. I think you had that night, the shock. If I strategized things a little bit better at that time when I was all in full swing, I would have been pretty good. But um, it didn't go that way, it went the other way. Yeah, look, and you know, don't be too hard on yourselves. That's what happens with a lot of trade businesses, we ride the waves like that. Look, it happened to me, right? I, I lost everything three, four years ago. I lost my yeah. house and everything. You know, yeah. I avoided bankruptcy, but. But I lost everything. I lost all my money. Like I think, you know, it's business, right? We we take risk, which you do in business, and with it you don't get the rewards without the risk. And sometimes it goes against you, and and you fuck up. You know? I think that's part of the deal. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully I can. Not very nice when it happens. Yeah, that's right. Hopefully I can climb back up that ladder. I know I've got all the equipment now, so that's one thing. That's at less expense that I had the last two years. I've got truck and a workshop and, a, and an office with everything I need in the office. So I was battling the last two years, I was battling trying to buy equipment, computers and everything just to try and keep up with everything and trucks and trailers and formwork and tools and all that sort of stuff. So I don't need to do that. That's a good thing. Yeah, really. So you, you know, your overheads will be less, which is good. Yeah, but I guess tax will be Look, more. Look, if the work's there, you can win some, you know. If there's a lot... The thing I think about the construction industry is it's such a big industry that, that there's always work out there to be had, you know. Do you remember in the GFC when everything was horrible? It only shrunk by 6%, the global economy. Yeah, yeah. You know, 94% of the work was still getting done. Yeah. I'm not yeah. quite sure where it was because I think sometimes it feels like it's all it all together, but some you know stuff was getting done somewhere. We just have to make sure you get your share, or more than your share. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's probably the hardest part about it at the moment. Whereas the last two years, I was I was knocking work back and passing it on to other people, but now I take anything. So it, it's all a bit <laughs> yeah, strange, but ho hopefully it, it picks up. I'm pretty sure it will. It's just. Um, a waiting game and probably change what I'm doing a little bit. Yeah, I think so. Look, we'll talk about that next week. Let's let's dig into it a bit next week. Yeah. All right. No worries, right. John. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Adam. I'm sorry there weren't more of you here. No, that's all right. Not a problem. Yeah. All right. Thank you, mate. Bye.